We have Patrick Fendora here, co-founder at Vetted Biz and Visa Franchise. Excited to have on Chris Stonis, who's a window guru. He's been in the franchise space for, for some time now. Really built his career in, in Canada and is coming down south of the border big. Chris, thanks a lot for joining. Thanks so much for having me, Patrick. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So you've been over a decade cleaning windows? I have been over a decade cleaning windows. Yeah. Um, the first half of that involved a, a lot more cleaning and the second half of that involved a lot more uh, logistics around other people doing the work. But I have seen uh, this industry from every possible vantage point, I think, at this point. And what keeps you because like I'm a big advocate of these industries that aren't like necessarily sexy and aren't like what people love to do but they get vocation and, and they get fulfillment through other other aspects of, of the business. And I imagine that resonates with you as well as the managers and, and team. What are some of the keys to that? Like, cause you obviously aren't obsessed and dreaming about windows and talking about it with, you know, at, at home. Um, how do you get fulfillment out of the work and how does your team get fulfillment? I think it goes back to like purpose and, and passion and, I, you know, I wish, I'm sure my wife wishes I didn't talk about washing windows <laughs> so much at home. Um, so you do, I was wrong. <laughs> really, it, uh, it's been a passion of mine. I kind of fell into this industry by accident. It wasn't necessarily on my life path. And I just found something that I really loved. I love, I saw opportunity. I think, you know, if, if you don't mind, I'll digress and kind of talk Let's about how it. I got here. And, and that kind of paints the picture of where, where we're going and why I'm so fulfilled by it. So in my early, early career, I actually worked in the music industry and I had climbed every possible ladder to get to the top of that industry. I was in my early twenties and I was working for a major recording studio for actually directly under Brian Adams and working with major recording artists. And I had climbed my whole life towards a singular goal and got there and was like, oh man, the top of the mountain isn't exactly the utopia I thought it would be. And holy crap, I'm going to be here for the rest of my career. And I'm in my early twenties <laughs> and, you know, ever to the, to the total shock of everyone in my life, I decided to stop working in the music industry, something I'd worked on for as long as I can remember. And I decided to walk home that day and saw a high rise window cleaner in downtown Vancouver and thought like that job is the exact opposite of a dark recording studio. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking outside. for. I want to be outside. I'll figure yeah. out what I'm going to do with my life. All I knew is I had rent to pay. And so I waited for the guy to get to the ground and I talked to him. He ended up offering me a job and <laughs> this was in uh, 2000 and late 2005, early 2006 era. And immediately I realized that I loved this job. I was outside. It was clean work. I was instant gratification. Yeah, the like, guys seem happy. Every yeah, time like, I see, you don't yeah, see they're, some, like, they, like they're pissed off, you know? It was an amazing job. And I realized very quickly that the opportunity in the industry, everywhere I looked, there was glass. And I was like, yeah. oh, I, I actually love what I'm doing here. And there is just endless glass to take care of. Like you said, it's unsexy, but it yeah. was- who cares? The opportunistic in person in me was like, I can continue climbing, which is what I got that satisfaction from in the recording studio in this industry. So I worked for, you know, uh, I guess till today, I'm still, you know, I still identify as a window cleaner when I meet people, but uh, I decided to launch a business in 2012 called Elite Window Cleaning in my hometown of Kingston, Ontario. And literally had a borrowed car and a bucket, decided I was going to figure this entrepreneurship thing out. And was it started. mostly residential, commercial? We actually started with commercial, which is interesting uh, as a franchisor because most franchisors focus on that low hanging fruit. But we started with commercial and that was where my world was. That's what I understood at the time. Residential actually came later, which is nice to have the low hanging fruit as dessert because it just seemed so, so fluid and easy given everything that our experience was based on. And we started building out systems and really looking at the industry, really wanting to be different and intentional. And the more we looked, the more we realized like the squeegee was patented in 1936 and it's still the main tool that every window cleaner in the world is using. So we saw an opportunity to apply technology um, to be able to clean up, you know, we can do up to six stories from the ground, which is, hmm. you know, if you had told me that 12 years ago, I would have said, there's no way, there's no, there's no possibility. What's the mechanism of that? So we use carbon fiber water fed poles. So these hmm. ultralight carbon fiber poles that are really rigid. And then we purify the water and pump it up 
to the brush on the end of the pole and we can scrub and rinse that window with the purified water. And because we've removed all the minerals, not to bore everyone listening to this, but once you remove all the minerals from the water, there's nothing left to create water spots. So we're able to guarantee results all the way up to six stories, which was obviously a total game changer in the industry. And that's when we thought we have to take this technology. We have to franchise. We have to, we didn't know franchising. You have to distribute. Like, yeah. We had to get it's it a to type the world. Franchising at the end of the day, it's a type of distribution where you have the, the system and model and whether exactly. it's a product or combined with the service. Yeah, that's exactly right. It was, we didn't know whether, whether it was corporate shops, whether it was franchising. All we knew is that the industry needed this change. The industry that we loved needed this change and we had figured it out. And how are we going to get this propagated across, you know, across the country in Canada and then ultimately, you know, the United States. And so we set off to begin franchising in uh, 2017, built a really neat system around my experience. I think it's a rare luxury for a franchisor to build the system around their own experience. I had grown a business from zero to one. I had grown a business and developed technology in this market. And I kind of looked at what we were doing and said, if I could just look at back at, at my own self and relieve all the pain points that I had throughout scale, what would that look like? And we whiteboarded it out and it was support with a call center and it was marketing support and it was client conversions. And it was all these little pieces that started to form this system that was is now the backbone of elite window cleaning in Canada and Sparkle Squad down in the in the before United you States. started franchising in 2017, like how big was the company in terms of like sales, headcount, or whatever you're comfortable so, sharing? Uh, yeah, uh, we were definitely seven figures um, in a really small market. Uh, our market here in Kingston, Ontario, is 160,000 total population, and we were doing seven figures, and we were just getting going really hmm. um the business so you're growing like at a double digit rate year over year oh yeah 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 and continued that up you know still to this day in this little market we're still continuing to grow in our corporate shop and we thought if we can take these systems that we figured out over a t you know i guess at this time it was uh like a six-year span and we can condense that for a franchise owner how quick could we bring them up the curve and so when we launched our first four franchise units we really watched them and really gave a, a prescription that was about bringing them up that curve, condensing what we had done in in their businesses. And it worked insanely well. Um, they all became household names in their individual markets. And it was like, wow, we're really, really on to something. And that's when uh, COVID hit. And here we are. We're right on to that's something. That's when I got my windows washed. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, we thought we went, oh my goodness, sucks, what do we like do? Looking out and, like... <laughs> <laughs> and, and COVID just, again, like just, it, like most home services just exploded for us. And it was, everything became even more, you know, fast paced. And we continued to drive up that curve. And like, late... I mean, I probably spent three waking hours at home. On like right. A work, work week. And yeah. then it like shot up in Miami, not as bad as Canada. I mean, I was only like six weeks, like working from home, but that was enough to wash my windows. I can only imagine yeah. if it was like two we years were like working 16 from home. Fifteen months, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, it was uh, it was incredible to see that. You know, we went into it going, "Oh, geez, are we about to find out our service isn't necessary?" Like there hmm. was the, like real war room conversations about what does this mean for these owners who have put their life savings into our vision and our dream, and you know, we quickly realized that demand was skyrocketing through all the way through the pandemic and put us in a really good position where in 2022, we were actually acquired by a brand group called Happy Nest Brands. Oh, yeah. um, we believe, had Andy we know them. from Mosquito yeah. Hunters on and a few of their franchisees as well. Yeah. And they were, you know, a, an, they are just an amazing group of people, like 10 out of 10 in every corner of that leadership and every brand leader that they have. And we thought this is the place where we can take everything that I've just talked about, you know, a, a decade almost at that point of work and then apply it in a way on the big stage. And where that's are they where based out of happiness brands? They're based at a home down New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they have distributed 
workforce across the country, but their headquarters is in Because, yeah, the, the culture doesn't seem like that, like, cutthroat New York. I would imagine more like Midwest, where uh, yeah, the studio hunters is based out of. They have a total kind of West Coast vibe to them, you exactly. know, they, yeah. but they are like, they are the firmly planted right in the, right in the heart of New Jersey. And uh, it was just a great fit. The cool part about where we are today, this is a long winded way to answer your question, but the cool part about where we are today is because Happy Nest has that insane infrastructure, you know, growing Lawn Doctor and bringing all these brands up the curve. And we have a decade worth of experience perfecting our systems. We are launching Sparkle Squad in the US, actually launched about two weeks ago with 100% white space. So we have <laughs> 10 years of refinement. We have all these things working in our favor. We have the catalyst of growth in Happy Nest. And now we get to bring this, you know, kind of perfect being to the world. And I'm Where just- Where the numbers are just like much bigger. I know from our Visa franchise job, we've helped a lot of Canadians move down South uh, to invest in franchises and like everything's kind of double. Exactly. Where, like on yeah. the financials. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Everything is double populations, double opportunity. Like it is just, you know, at the end of the day, there is glass everywhere. And, you know, we're going to wash windows on retirement homes, hospitals, homes, you know, whatever in Canada and the States. It's just so much more like there's just so much more, you know, there's a hundred X of everything there is in Canada. So it's pretty, pretty amazing place to be right now. How many units did you have um, before you expanded to the U.S.? So we had eight units uh, covering coast to coast, all the way from Nova Scotia to British Columbia. If anybody wow. knows, if anybody knows those those areas, listening from Canada, and like the density here just isn't the same. I think we'll top out somewhere around forty units in the country okay. in total, where that opportunity in the U.S. is you know three, What's four, five hundred. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. much bigger opportunity. What's like your ideal persona? Like, obviously you were attracted to happiness and there was a cultural fit. What's like the next cultural fit for the the franchisee and being part of the happiness? And, and that's a, that's a great squad? question because that took us a long time to really dial in because in one thing that I love about franchising is it's, it's less about where that person's coming from and more about where they're going. It's like looking for those things in people that identify them as having a high level of attainment and they want to take this thing that we've created and prove to the world how awesome they can be with that in their hands so we call it the empire builder we're looking for somebody who wants to build a very large business like our franchise owners have here like our corporate shop take the playbook and not be you know a guy in a truck with a helper or have one or two trucks we want our owners and our Territories are specifically carved around them being able to have five, six, seven, ten trucks on the road and grow really what's big. A, what's a territory look like, like in terms of number of people? It's less about people and more about target people. So thirty-five thousand target households. So that's the minimum we'll do is thirty-five thousand absolute grade A kind of Kobe. What defines success? Like getting three percent, five percent of that market. So an empire builder is going to want to be market dominant because this market is so, oh, sorry. so, so friendly. say like 35,000, like prospective customers, like how many actual oh, customers do you need where it's like, okay, you've got this. I would say when you start to cross that four or 5,000 mark, you are running, you know, six vehicles. That's like, hmm. that's getting to that market saturation. But the cool thing about this business is it's cash flow positive really, really quickly because it doesn't have a lot of overhead. So we have, you know, your vehicles, you get all the tools. We call it the job pod. It's all the tools on four wheels. Everything's housed within this amazing van. And you go out with two tax and you're turning, you know, day one, you have a full schedule. You're turning profitable work right out of the gates without this overhead kind of burdening your growth path. So we see most owners add a second vehicle in the first year and then continue to build their client base. And one of the neat parts about this industry is it works like a snowball. It's it's you you get these clients and you pack them in tight and you do an amazing job. And the next year your marketing is going to just wrap around the outside of that. And those initial clients, they stay in the middle. They're still getting that repeat service. So how often? Uh generally it's it's about 1.7 full cleans a year. And okay. that's you know taken down by the ones that get it once, and then it's inflated by the ones that get it five, six, seven times. But that's just in residential. The, the commercial cycle is 
vastly different. You have your monthly accounts, you have your biannual institutional accounts. We put a lot of focus, as I said at the beginning, on uh, three verticals. We have our residential vertical, which is, you know, Patrick, you're the new franchise owner. Your low hanging fruit is to go out and get cash flow positive in residential. Let's go. Let's get you up and cash flowing. And then we start to fold in commercial, which is your storefront accounts, your retirement homes, and your hotels. And then the longest point- Probably more of a sales process where consumers exactly. is more of like a marketing. You got it. To sign up. You got it precisely. It's, it's relationships. And the bigger the accounts, the longer the gestation period of those relationships. But imagine, ultimately- yeah, The sales cycle could be long, but after you're in, it's a nice moat. Yeah. After you, you know, bag a university campus, every piece <laughs> of glass inside and out, yeah. five-year contract. Don't it, switch around. Yeah, exactly. And we do that. Like we have in our system, just, just in Canada here, multiple hospitals, multiple university campuses. Um, you know, there's windows everywhere. Like I said at the beginning, like our world's made of glass and the industry to maintain that glass just hasn't kept Who's up. buying the service? Is it like the property manager or who would, who do you sell to? It depends in the vertical. So yeah. in, in uh, that middle bucket, so like that general commercial, it's going to be a property manager. It's going to be a hotel general manager, or it's going to be the store manager if we're talking storefronts. And then in that institutional bucket, it's going to be project managers. It's going to be, you know, a bidding process that you're going to go through with, you know, some sort of board that's, you know, dictating this massive contract at a university level, let's say. So we coach our owners on every one of those verticals from day one. And, you know, in the early days, we're saying, get cash flow positive. Yes. You know, deploy the marketing, the marketing works. We've centralized it, you know, get your business running, but we're always going to coach you from day one to start planting seeds in these other gardens so that, you know, in a couple of years, you got crops over there that are really, really meaningful to your bottom line. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I see that there's every day I, I talk to prospective franchisees and people in the industry. I mean, there's businesses that are like up and down, like where it's just like a one off service, like you're installing floors or you're selling right. a, a mattress. And then other ones like property management that are just study up like that. But the problem with that is it takes a long time to hit cash flow positive. If you're just yeah. if you're, it's a renewable contract, like it's pretty hard to convince and it takes time and, and credibility to get there. Well, that's what I think we have this super luxury of having those three, like, you know, that we have that mechanism and residential for cash flow positivity. And then we have that empire builder mindset to build that seven figure business. Like at the end of the day, that is what we're setting out for owners to be able to build meaningful, big businesses in an industry that is just so overlooked. Nobody looks at this industry and goes, I'm going to go wash windows and build a seven figure business. That's going to have, you know, a uh, return and an exit multiple on it. There's nobody who thinks that way, but the reality is we all look through windows all day, every day. Like somebody has got to take care of that stuff. And have you thought about, or has any of your franchisees grown inorganically? Like where you buy a mom and pop and then rebrand? We have thought about it. Honestly, we haven't done that. We've had franchise owners buy out a neighboring franchise owner where they were just growing like a rocket sure. ship and yeah. everybody wins in that situation. You know, it, it was actually really, it was kind of a point of pride to grow the system to the point where somebody was succeeding to the point where they were able to cannibalize their neighbor and the neighbor was happy about the exit. Like, yeah, that, that was it's, really a, it's cool. a really positive thing. And I know that similar things happen with other happiness brands. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, you find those owners who just want to keep growing and we just keep you know, feeding them the, the ability to do so. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting position to, again, I come back to having this experience and then launching Sparkle Squad with this white space. Like it's, it's almost like a dream come true because we have the refinement in place before we start. Right. Yes. Who do you guys like compete against? So comp competition is really, really mom and pa. It's fragmented. Okay, yeah. The majority of window cleaners or window cleaning businesses in North America, and I mean the vast majority, are two to three to five person operations. It's and you know any given market will have ten window cleaners each taking one little sliver of the total address. That sounds market. about right. Like, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I think I had like four quotes and, and there were no franchise brands. Like I wanted to investigate mm -hmm. and there was none operating here uh, yeah. at, least at the time in Miami beach. And, yeah. but like the Delta was crazy in terms of the quotes I got mm -hmm. where it was like thousands of dollars off, like in either yeah. direction. The industry has no standard. And that's, that's one of the areas 
actually, if you don't mind me going a little deep on that, it's one of the cool things that we figured out um, early on was the industry had no standard practice and the conversion gestation for customers, there was no, like you said, there was no commonality in how that felt as a customer. Or a it's customer. like distrusting. Like I start getting distrusted and maybe I'll just stop and not yeah. get my windows cleaned. And so what <laughs> we did is we flat rated everything to the, to the point where every window cleaner on the planet told that I knew anyway, told me that it's not possible. And we flat rated window cleaning by square footage of the home. So okay, the, cool. So when you called in, we so did you might get happen. totally screwed on a project, but that's like 1% of the cases, but well, 99% of the time it's fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's sub 1% because we built it around those worst case, you know, we add those worst case scenarios into the formula. So it's less than 1%. Yeah. yeah you're still profitable. And, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Worst case scenario, yeah. you're still profitable. Yeah. Best case scenario, you're, ex, you know, exceptionally profitable and and when we flat rated, we realized that that unlocked everything because nobody calls the window cleaner if they don't want to buy window cleaning. So yeah. our conversion rate in our call center is above 80% on incoming huh. calls. Wow. Because people are calling to buy window cleaning and we have flat rated the price. There's no pressure. What would you like? <laughs> Everything's a la carte. Would you like you to make it? Do you have an option where I, I don't have to talk to anyone? I could just do we, everything online. We do. We have an online booking engine, which fed in. It's amazing that you brought that I up. I feel like it, Americans are really going to love that. Cause like... it makes up 20% <laughs> of our sales now. It's like we, it, and it came to me when we were buying my, I was buying dog food and in, in my bed, laying next to my wife, having a conversation about needing to buy dog food. And I was like, if I'm buying dog food online, like why can't people buy window cleaning? And so we yeah. built this, we call it the OBE for, for the acronym. And we, we built it out. And yeah, now 20% of all residential sales, people are making through the online booking engine. And what's and, the uh, ticket price, if you don't mind me asking, or range? Uh, your average job size through the OBE is going to be right around 325 You know, okay, it's, it's yeah. usually... Like, and I don't want to talk to someone if I'm spending 325 Exactly. And then they'll get if the it's confirmation. In the thousands, call. It could be good to talk to someone, but like 325, exactly. I don't want to deal with someone. Exactly. And then we'll do the confirmation call from the, from, we call it the jungle. Our call center will, will call out uh, the next day and just say, Hey, Patrick, we see you went online. You booked these services, go quick run through top to bottom and say, you know, if you're interested, we also do, you may not know we do X, Y, and Z, yeah. you know, upsell and then opportunity. upsell opportunity, but we've already established the trust by everything being a la carte. So yeah. it's, it's really worked well for us. And that's another thing that allows us to deploy that digital marketing and see that return. Like when your franchise, when our franchise owners are sleeping, customers are buying all hours of the day from their business. It's, it's yeah, pretty amazing. I mean, a sales qualified lead, like if they're closing at 80%, you could pay a lot of money for that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the kind of the magic of the industry is nobody's paying hardly anything for window cleaning leads because competition is so fragmented and low. So we're getting this disproportionate value on our PPC, Facebook and LSA ads and then converting them at a really high rate. It's a real win-win situation. And I'm sure this is like 10 years of work and, and playing around with basically the product yeah. service together with the, the marketing yeah. funnel. You're hearing the highlights, man. There's, there's, <laughs> so many, there's so many things that you have to do and you have to experience to get these great yeah, you outcomes. You probably blew through hundreds of thousands of dollars like on oh, marketing for sure. funnels. And Figuring out channels that work, but once they're dialed in, then they're dialed. And it's yeah. like, we have just been iterative. We have this idea, you know, we have a no jerks policy and a best idea wins policy. So, and we just are constantly iterating and improving. And we listen to everyone from a franchise owner to a field technician. If, if they come with an amazing idea. Who's we like, what kind of level of support can someone expect if they're opening up a franchise here in the U S or up in Canada? Yeah. So, um, we is like, uh, the, you know, our corporate setup here. So we have a fully staffed call center, the jungle, as I alluded to earlier. So we have management in place there. And then we have, uh, we call them FBAs or franchise business advisors that coach the franchise owners day in and day out, you know, in the first formative months and years, they're really, really hands-on. And then as they level up into new, uh, revenue brackets, we actually have separate coaching programs that coach to getting you from this revenue bracket into the next. One of the biggest hires we made here recently that's just unlocked a ton of value is we hired a, a director of operational excellence. Hmm. So somebody who's just focused on improving the operations, agnostic to why, agnostic to departments, and, and her name's Alex Clark. And she just does a tremendous job of 
looking through our business and just looking for those little things that we can optimize. So when we say we, our whole business is based on symbiosis. And that is the franchise or doesn't win unless the franchise wins. So our whole job is to maximize the success opportunity of franchise owners. Therefore, we can have our own success on the royalty income stream. And we are really open about that, which I think should be more par for the course in franchising. Like royalty income stream is how we make our revenue as a franchisor, but we only do that if you succeed. So we are completely aligned intrinsically on the output of what you're looking for. And we really lean into that as motivation for how we can help our franchise owners and how we can help them help themselves. And I know in Canada, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've you've had creative financing mechanisms to to get top talent open and have their own franchise and not having the money come in the way of our film. Exactly. Film yeah. Version. I mean, like we do have like net worth requirements as you go through development, but there are SBA loans in the US. There are, you know, BDC, there's a program called Futurepreneur that works with people under 40 who want to open their own business and gives them, you know, amazing rates on, on cash. So like we're looking for amazing people. And, and that's what drives our decision-making around here is like, are you the right fit for this brand? And can you, can you do what you want to do? And if it's yes and yes, we do everything we can to get that person to the success point. How has your role evolved post acquisition? It's been what, about a year? It's been about a year. Um, my role has, it's, it's pretty well the same. Like I was the CEO before I'm the CEO. Now what I have at my disposal is an unbelievable amount of peers with deep industry roots. So I would say everything has gotten easier because I have a network. I'm not in an echo chamber anymore, yeah. but it's gotten harder because I've People unlocked that on your team. <laughs> yeah. I've unlocked the ability now to grow and to, to bring up just to do more. So yeah. as a, you know, I the expectations more much higher where you're in Canada to get awesome. We got to 10 or no U S is yeah. going to get a hundred, get to 150. Yeah. And, you know, not, not wait too long to get there. <laughs> well, we got the team in place to, to make it happen. Our, our, everyone in this, in this business is just amazing. And I hope that, you know, they all listen to this and hear me say that out <laughs> loud because it's very true. Chris, are there any items that we didn't talk about today that you think might be relevant for prospective franchisees? I don't know. We that was pretty broad strokes. Um, what I would say, if anybody's listening to this, you know, and, and might be a, per, a potential franchisee or interested in, in owning a, a Sparkle Squad or an elite franchise, I would say take a walk and look at the look at the glass in this world, and then really think about the industry of maintaining it and how far it is behind, you know, everything else that we interact with on a daily basis. That's that's usually my like people are going to get it or they're not. And that simple exercise can show you that there is, the world is made of glass and uh, we're ready to change. Yeah. We're ready to change out. Yeah. Awesome, Chris. Well, I really appreciate your time. We'll be sure to leave links to both uh, the Canadian elite as well as Sparkle for those that are looking to invest in in a franchise here in the U S appreciate it. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thanks, Chris.